um, doing lecture number 27 hyphen three, uh, meeting fluid, food and fluid needs. So one of the things we have to talk about is measuring food intake. So the most frequent way you'll do it is by measuring the percentage or recording the percentage of the food eaten, ranging anywhere from zero to 100%. The other way is if a patient is on a calorie count. A calorie count is when um, generally used in circumstances where a patient is not eating very well and they're worried about his dietary status. Um, everything that the patient eats is written uh, uh, both the amount and how much the patient ate. So. Um, um, so to, for an example, if the patient has chicken and mashed potatoes and green beans, you would put half a piece of chicken, uh, one half mashed potatoes, and uh, you know all the green beans or 100 percent of the green beans. Um, many places what they do is they use the um, when the patient has a meal brought to them, it usually has a slip of paper which identifies all the things that are on the tray. And usually you can record the percentage of each thing on that slip and keep the slip uh, usually on a clipboard uh, somewhere uh, where the near in the patient's room or at the door. Um, then what happens is the dietitian takes those and records uh, the transfers all of what was eaten into calories and breaks it up into what they've had protein wise, carbohydrate wise, and fat wise. But most frequently, you'll see the percentage of food eaten. So because of that, you need to become familiar with percentages, and I'm sure most of you are. So this diagram shows different percentages. And um, so 100% being everything, OK, everything completely eaten, as opposed to 0%, which has eaten nothing, OK? Um, if they've eaten 25% of their meal, it would be a half of a half or one quarter. Um, this is an example of 33%, 75% um, and 100%. So um, in your certification exam, the only ones you have to worry about are 0%, 25%, 50%, 75% or 100% is what you would put on the recording sheet, all right? In terms of meals, this is what it would look like. Uh, zero percent, didn't eat a thing. Um, ate a little bit, a couple strawberries, a little bit of potato, and a little bit of, um, of meat, uh, along with some asparagus. But so you consider this 25 percent. 33 percent, I really wouldn't worry about because we generally don't use that. So 50 percent, about half, um, and then 75 percent. And then if they lick the plate clean, that gives them 100%. <clears throat> OK. So if you have difficulty with that, you want to touch base with me um, so that we can, um, we can help you out with that. Also, in your book on page, uh, hold on, on page um, 455 at the bottom, there's a box called um, Focus on Math. And you can also use that to help you if you're having difficulties with the percentages. So let's talk a little bit about fluid balance. Um, fluid balance is very, fluids are very important. Water is a large portion, portion of our body and it does not uh, survive a very long time if it does not get fluids. So the amount taken in must be equal to the amount of fluid loss. So intake versus output. Um, and you will hear more about that shortly. So intake includes flu fluid and foods. Um, output includes urine, feces, vomiting, perspiration. Even <clears throat> the air that you're breathing out contains some fluid in it, uh, although we're not able to measure that. It's uh, perspiration and exhalation uh, um, fluids are generally considered insensible losses insensible losses. So that's I-N-S-E-N-S-I-B-L-E. -S -S that's insensible loss. So if a person gets too much fluid, meaning their intake exceeds their output, 
what happens is the tissues begin to swell and this is called edema. So when you have swelling like in the ankles or your hands are swollen or a patient's hands are swollen, that's called edema. On the other end of it, when there's a deficiency where you have put out more than you've taken in, that is called dehydration, all right? Dehydration. So normal adult fluid requirements, that's just basically to survive is, uh, let me get that uh, recording box out of the way, is 1,500 milliliters. So that's the bare minimum. Usually you try to maintain 2,000 to 2,500 milliliters of, for normal fluid balance. Um, and of course, that amount increases with things like hot weather, um, if a patient exercises, uh, fever, illness, excessive fluid losses such as vomiting and diarrhea. So you want to keep those in mind um, when you're considering a patient's fluid balance. Now, <clears throat> a couple of, uh, of situations, children and elderly, once again, are at risk. Children have more body water and so fluid losses cannot be tolerated as much as an adult. So it's very important to make sure, that's why children when they get sick get dehydrated very quickly. So it's very important if a child hasn't had fluids and they are vomiting that you need to get them to a doctor or to an emergency room at an earlier state than you would an adult. Now with the elderly, their body water decreases with age. Um, so they don't have as much body water. Diseases and medications that can affect their fluid balance, many of them are on diuretics, which are medications that draw fluid out of the body. So because of that, they can tend to be more frequently dehydrated than other people. Um, they are at risk of both dehydration and edema. Edema because many times their heart is weak and um, that will lead to some edema and uh, an altered fluid balance. So there are many times where special fluid orders will be written for patients just as there were special diet orders. One of them is encouraged fluids. Um, so in that case, anytime you're in a patient's room, you would make sure you would offer them a drink of fluid. Make sure their water picture is always full. Uh, offer them other types of fluids, but you want to encourage as much as possible. Then on the other end is restricting fluids. Sometimes patients, because of edema, because of heart failure, because of other, like uh, kidney failure, fluids have to be restricted on those patients. So in those cases, you would not keep a water pitcher near the patient's bedside. Generally, in those cases, you only have the fluids that are on the meal trays. Then there is nothing by mouth, otherwise known as NPO. That is a, a, um, um, an abbreviation that you need to know because you'll hear it a lot. NPO comes from the uh, Latin, which means null par aris, so nothing by mouth is essentially what it um, means. In it, in, um, that's where those letters came from, from the, the Latin version. <clears throat> then there are situations where patients have thickened fluids, and we talked about that when we talked about dysphagia and aspiration precautions. And another order you might see is strict INO. That's strict intake and output. So when you have to record their intake and their output, um, that is called INO. And you will have an INO sheet that you will use to record that. We will look at an example of that in a little while. So intake and output records are ordered when the fluid balance is important to evaluate. Daily weights may also be ordered because weight is a very sensitive indicator of fluid balance. Um, if a patient gains a, a pound a day, that's generally not because of what they ate. It generally is because of fluid. So fluid measurements are in the metric system. So one ounce is equal to 30 milliliters and milliliters are the same thing as cc's. Um, and those are written as small c, ccs, meaning cubic centimeters. 
30 milliliters is equal to 30 cubic centimeters or 30 cc's. One pint is equal to approximately 500 milliliters. One quart is equal to 1,000 milliliters or one liter, okay? Metric system um, is very easy to follow. It's all based on uh, a, the, the, um, the 10 scale. So um, unfortunately, we have a system that's a lot more difficult to learn. Um, so, but it's important for you to become familiar with the metric system because that is what uh, we will use in healthcare. So measuring devices that are used, a one liter container is known as a graduate or a graduate cylinder. And I'll show you a picture of that. And I think I've shown some people in class a graduate cylinder. Uh, specimen cups are used for amounts of 120 milliliters or less, and those are small plastic cups. I will have one on display in the classroom. And then reading with measuring devices at the eye level. You always want to make sure that you read uh, the amount of fluid at eye level because otherwise, because of what's called the meniscus or the bubble of water at the surface, you're, you could have an altered uh, amount uh, recorded because of the uh, view that you had. Universal precautions should be used with handling any body fluids, including eyes, uh, including protecting your eyes as well, okay? So this is an example of a um, graduate cylinder. So notice on the left are ounces and on the right are milliliters. So you will generally use the one on the right. And if you look, you notice that there are marks every quarter measurement. So the first small line at the bottom would be 25 millimeters, then 50 milliliters, then 75 milliliters, then 100 milliliters. And then it would continue 125, 150, 175, 200, all the way to 1,000. In the next picture, this is a picture of how you should look at a graduate cylinder when you're recording a measurement. Either that or you sit it on a counter and you scrouch down to get at eye level. That will be part of our skill of um, emptying the urinary uh, drainage system. Um, and you, one of the things they look at is that you um, measure the, the amount of fluid at eye level. So this is an example of a urinal with measurements up on the side. And here we see that the, four, the spaces between 300 and 400, there's four of them, and they're delineated at 25 millimeter, milliliters each, okay? If you have any questions about that math, you want to check with me so that I can help you with that. So intake and output records. Uh, most of the time, things are totaled every eight hours. But in some cases, it may be hourly measurements in an intensive care unit if a patient is seriously ill and you want to watch their intake and output on an hourly basis. Our INOs are usually recorded in an end of shift report. So when you report off as a CNA to the next shift, you would want to make sure what uh, the intake and output was. Uh, it's important if a patient is on intake and output that you educate the patient and the family about that because they may get the patient up to the bathroom and not put a measuring device in the toilet and then you've lost uh, that fluid that you have no idea how much there was. Also, you want to avoid toilet tissue being placed in the receptacle uh, in cases where a patient has is having uh, intake and output recorded. So we talked about earlier, calorie counts may also be collected. Um, and then once again, that's a flow sheet recording what and how much a patient has eaten. Accuracy and consistency are very important in those circumstances. Here is an example of an intake and output record. Okay, as you can see here, this is separated into three sections, three sections all based on time. So it's the day shift, the, uh, well, no, this starts on the night shift. So the night shift, the day shift, and the evening shift. So the night shift usually goes from midnight to 7 a.m. The day shift usually goes from 7 to 3. And the evening shift goes from 3 to 11. Many places now work in 12-hour shifts. Uh, so you'll have to note in your facility 
what um, time increments are used on the I and O. So here you see uh, what they took in orally, uh, and parenteral is uh, intravenous fluids. So those would be recorded here. Then notice how there's a dark line, so everything on this side is intake, everything on this side is output. And here you have the method collected, either V for voided or C for catheter, and then the amount uh, in, is put here. Um, then um, here is other yeah, output. So here you would put, it looks like here they put VOM for vomiting, 150 cc's. Uh, and then if somebody had irrigations, then that would be put in here. Many times on the INO, there is uh, a scale up here of what, a, you know, what the common containers used in the facility and how, much, uh, how many milliliters each one is. Um, and then below here are some of the abbreviations that they use. So common serving sizes, uh, a milk carton is 240 milliliters or eight ounces. Uh, a jello container generally is about 120 milliliters or four ounces, as is a juice glass. Water pitchers are usually a thousand milliliters. If you have, give somebody ice chips, sometimes uh, patients are only ordered that they can only have ice chips for oral comfort. Half the amount of the container is how much is taken. So if they have 120 milliliter uh, filled with ice, then if they've taken all of that, they've had 60 milliliters of water. Many times there's other examples uh, on the INO sheet, um, um, as I showed you, of uh, the different containers that are used in a particular facility. So meeting fluid, if, uh, uh, meeting food and fluid needs, um, how you prepare patients for meals. You want Many times it's best before meal to assist them with elimination meals. It needs either urination or, or um, uh, bowel elimination um, because you don't want that to interrupt their meal. And many times uh, once they start drinking, they suddenly feel like they have to go. Uh, you want to provide oral hygiene and assure that dentures are in place before a meal. Make sure their eyeglasses and hearing aids are in place so they can see um, <clears throat> what they're eating. In addition, they can uh, remember meals are a social event, so you want to make sure that they can uh, hear as well. Make sure the patient is clean and dry, so make sure they haven't been incontinent. Make sure that their clothes is uh, dry. And make sure that the patient is in a comfortable position or in a proper place. Um, the most important thing is to make sure they're sitting upright so that uh, there's less chance of them having any problems with swallowing. Assist the patient with hand washing. Um, you saw that in the hand wash, the, um, the, the feeding um, skill that we offer a hand wipe before they eat. Uh, if they have assistive devices that are needed, make sure they are available. And if you look on your in your book on page uh, 450, there are examples of assistive devices used for meals. So let's talk about serving the meal tray. The goal is that hot foods are hot and cold foods are cold. That is the requirement of OBRA. They, um, so um, it's important for you to know that that is a, a very important criteria that uh, OBRA wants maintained in any healthcare facility. So do not delay. If, the, if it's the, the meal comes up and it isn't served within 15 minutes, you should check the temperature of it before you give the patient uh, the meal to make sure that hot things are hot and cold things are cold. Uh, reheating in, uh, in microwaves may or may not be allowed in some facilities. Uh, because of sometimes there's hot, hot, hot spots when you microwave a piece of uh, food, uh, you want to make sure that that's allowed in your facility. Sometimes if a meal gets cold, you have to call down to the kitchen to get a whole new meal. Some facilities have room service where uh, patients can order meals when they want. They don't have to do them at specific times. Uh, where we go, Menorah Manor, uh, the, the meals are served at sp particular times. Um, make sure you have the correct tray for the correct patient. Also make sure that 
they have the correct fluids that if it needs to be thickened, that that is the correct fluid that they get with their tray. Open any pa uh, package items uh, and add any desired condiments. If they want salt on anything, pepper on anything. If they have a burger, do they want ketchup or mustard? Uh, those types of things. Now feeding the patient, we went through the skill. You want to sit while you're feeding the patient. You can either do a single patient or U-shaped where you have a number of patients who are in a U-shape around you. Um, offer the, to protect the patient's clothing with a barrier. Uh, feed the foods in the order that the patient prefers. That should be on the next line, unfortunately. Um, use a teaspoon um, and want to make sure that it's only a third full. Uh, offer fluids throughout the meal every two to three bites. We've talked about that and make sure the patient has had an opportunity to swallow before offering another bite. That's very important um, because that can lead to aspiration. <clears throat> and conserve, uh, converse with the patient. That means talk with the patient during the meal. Remember, meals are a social event. Make sure the patient is left clean and comfortable after the meal. All right. So continuing with meeting fluid, uh, food and fluid needs, allow time for privacy and, or for prayer. There, many people like to uh, pray before a meal and allow the patient time for that. Engage the patient in pleasant conversation we talked about. Allow time for chewing and swallowing sit facing the patient. That way you get to see how they are doing, tolerating it, and whether they're having any difficulties with swallowing. Um, you can also see if, um, so th those are uh, the things that I just said. All right, so now let's talk about between meals nourishments. There are some diets that require between meal uh, nourishments, especially diabetic diets. Uh, snacks are served uh, upon the arrival on the nursing unit. Try not to delay so that cold things are cold, hot things are hot. Follow the same considerations as procedures that you would do for serving meals and feeding people. Um, so you want to make sure you set time aside in your routine for those between meal snacks. Uh, calorie counts we already talked about. Providing drinking water. Uh, patients and residents need to have fresh drinking water each shift and whenever the pitcher is empty. Um, and you would follow the agency's policy with that. At Menorah Manor, there are times where you will be asked to go around and um, make sure the patients have fresh drinking water. So that may be part of your, your um, responsibilities. Let's take a moment to talk about foodborne illnesses, and this will be the last part of this lecture. Um, a foodborne illness or food poisoning is caused by pathogens in food or fluids. Um, so foods are not sterile. So uh, it's important to know that there um, many times are um, bacteria in small concentrations in food, and they're kept in small concentrations by keeping them cold. But if they're left warm for long periods of time, or if they're not cooked thoroughly, then you could have problems with uh, a lot of bacteria and enough that it could cause problems. Uh, so you want to report any signs and symptoms to the nurse as soon as possible. Um, and uh, those would be um, any uh, vomiting that happens directly after a meal. If um, they have any episodes of diarrhea shortly after a meal, you want to make sure you report all of those. Remember, food is not sterile. Pathogens are present when the food is purchased, but they're in very small amounts. Uh, the foods can be contaminated from other foods, so be careful um, that you don't contaminate other foods um, that uh, with some of the the other foods that might have bacteria in it. Food handlers with poor hygiene can contaminate the food. Um, so, um, you know, some of the, the utensils that are used, all of that can, um, if it's not cleaned well, it can contaminate the food. Uh, pathogens grow rapidly between the degrees of 40 and 140 degrees. So those are called the danger zones uh, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So um, if uh, the food has not been brought to a hot enough temperature to be fully cooked, then um, that can be quite dangerous. Or if it's um, 
something that uh, is has not been kept less than 40 degrees when it's been refrigerated, then that can be dangerous. So to keep food safe, the USDA re recommends these four safety tips. Clean. So you want to wash your hands, wash utensils and countertops, um, especially after they've had foods on them. Uh, separate. Avoid cross-contamination uh, of, of uh, of foods, uh, something that has been um, uh, um, so uh, sorry, somebody came in the room. So in terms of cross contamination, do not let like raw meat or poultry or their juices touch other foods uh, um, that will not be cooked, okay? so, Try to avoid that. Um, and then the next one is cook. Uh, make sure you cook at a safe internal temperature. Um, usually most things uh, about 160 degrees or more. Um, so reheat, reheat cooked foods to 165 degrees. So I'm sorry, I shouldn't have, uh, it's 165 degrees. And then chill, refrigerate or freeze foods within two hours, okay? Uh, you don't want to go any more than that. You, in your book, there is a, on page 468, there's a box that talks about foodborne illness signs and symptoms. And right below that is a food temperature guide um, that you should review. And that will end this lecture. Um, thank you very much for your attention and see you in class.